Hi and good evening everybody. Welcome to the webinar. It's August 3rd, 2015. For some of you, some of this is going to be a review. This is some material that I think gets included in a lot of the webinars and a lot of the instruction that I do because I'm talking about wilderness therapy pretty consistently. But what I try to do also tonight is, is to go back and do some more gathering of information about experiential therapy in general and the brain and how we process our wounds and our trauma. So it really does take a deeper and broader look at what we're doing with wilderness therapy and what we're trying to accomplish and how wilderness therapy does it so well. And we've also evolved over the years. And so when I did this webinar for the first time five, six, seven years ago, some of the ideas that I have now weren't even included in it because we didn't have those. We didn't, we didn't include as much of an emphasis on mindfulness and whole health, holistic health. But this is my favorite place to start. And it really starts back during my undergraduate degree. I attended a class uh, a family psychology course called Spiritual Life and Temporal Relationships in the Home. I had no idea what that was, but it was a required course. So I took it. And we started to started the semester off watching two documentaries. The first was of the, a, a primitive tribe in Africa and the way that they raised their children. It was just a, a day in the life of and, and followed around the parents and the children. The fathers would go out with the <clears throat> older boys and he would gather and he would hunt with them and teach them. All throughout the day, he would tell stories that were part about the legend, part about the myths that they followed or believed in, and then part about daily survival. And then when you, when you watch the mothers, they would stay closer to the home and they would fish and they would also take care of home tasks. And the younger children and all of the girls stayed with them. And again, all throughout the day, she would tell them stories legends, oral traditions. And in the context of that, there were embedded in, in these stories, the ideas for survival. And at night they would sit around a fire and they would tell stories, they would have ceremonies. And there was this wonderful blend between life and living and the values of, of the culture. And then we contrasted that with another documentary. It was a documentary of the mother of the year at the time in Utah. And I think that's a pretty significant award given how many mothers and how many children often are included in, in families in Utah. And it followed her around for a day in the life of, and she was incredibly productive and busy and, and well-organized. She had class time for her children. She had play time for her children. She had cleanup time. Uh, the cleanup was done when the children were napping, a majority of it. And there was another point that became poignant as we did this analysis where the children were playing around in their rumpus room and she interrupted it so that they could have organized calisthenics, organized exercise. And, and what you saw was this division between what she believed and, and what she thought and, and daily living. The children weren't involved in daily living. All of the lessons, all of the values were to be taught in this sort of contrived way. She had to find a way to, to pass on those values. So we started to understand this idea that Abraham Maslow had, which is a very accepted idea in Western culture, of this idea that it, it first is, is a requirement that we take care of our physical and, and safety issues, needs, right? We have to take care of those. If we're worried, he postulates, about taking care of our physical needs, then we can't move on to higher level, higher order needs, like what it means to belong to a group and what it means to be a self, right? Because we're co constantly concerned with that. But our analysis showed that it was in the context of struggling to survive that those lessons were often best transmitted, that's passed on. And that there was this, in primitive cultures, this fusion between the religion, you know, the belief system, the stories, and the daily struggle to survive. And in American culture, in Western culture, we look at the struggle to survive as something to get past, something to get by, something that is a barrier so that we can then recreate or enjoy ourselves or pontificate things. Whereas in primitive cultures, they don't have that luxury. So the theory, the course suggested that, that Maslow theory was, was fundamentally off base. And that, that our families, like the mother of the year who had to stop the, the children from exercising so she could get them to exercise, that we had separated out who we really were from, from what it meant to live. And the more contrived the lessons, the less likely they are to be taken in by the child. They seem to come from the parent. They don't seem to be about life. And I think about that also in the context of the struggle that all of you are going through with your children. And I would say in many cases, it is a struggle to survive. 
And, and is your relationship with that challenge, with that problem, like this old Maslow idea? That this is something to get through, to get past. Instead of, this is our life. And it is offering us some great wisdom, some great treasure, some great transformation. Our professor shared these two quotes, which I thought were very powerful. One, this is from 1922. Once men, women, and, and children shared the heavy work of dragging carpets outside of their annual beating. Now there were vacuum cleaners, a gift for whom? House cleaning was now a job for one, one person could do all by herself. And this other quote from an anthropologist in 1959. When my child was two or three, I used to shell peas with her. Nowadays, I buy my peas already shelled and packaged. This saves time and the peas are fresher. But was, that, but was this all that happened while I shelled, when I shelled peas with my daughter? Did I merely get a dish of peas? It was a total process. And if I am going to see to it that the totality of the important aspects are retained, I shall have to find out what they were and then find, out, find the media through which they can continue to be expressed. So, have we in our rush in Western culture to get away from pain, to get away from death, discomfort, to get through, get by, get over our challenges, wherever they might be, in our lives, in the lives of our children, or our families, have we become so focused on, on that way of living that we have forgotten how to take advantage of, of the, the wisdom, the joy, the experience that life has to offer us? And that really, that was something I learned long before I'd ever heard about wilderness therapy. But when I came into wilderness therapy and somebody asked me, what makes it work? What, what makes it so effective? Because it's such a powerful intervention. I asked myself this question over and over again. And I thought it's because it's not a contrived lesson. It's because nature doesn't play favorites. It's because the lessons that we teach are through a Baudrillard fire, through cooking dinner around a campfire, through crushing coals in the morning to, to practice leave no trace, to move from one site to another to get our next drop of water, to learn how to work as a group to accomplish all of those tasks. Those are, are, are where the, the rich, that's the rich vehicle, I, I suppose you would say, through which we pass on these lessons. And if we walk in through the front door and say, and we do some of this, of course. But if we walk in through the front door, like we do in talk therapy and outpatient therapy, and we say, let's talk about schools. Let's talk about the way you're treating your parents. Let's talk about your relationship with your friends. Right? If, we, if we walk in through the front door with those, the first thing that's going to happen with the adolescent or young adult is a wall is going to go up, right? They're going to recognize that as an intrusion, and they're going to put up this defense. But if we can have that same discussion through the medium of working on a bojo fire together, or, or, or weaving something to make natural cordage, or learning how to build a shelter, we're going to be able to teach and pass on all the same lessons that life has to offer. I remember an old Derek Jeter commercial. He's a baseball player, for you, those of you who don't know, a great New York Yankee baseball player. He was the captain of the team for 10 or 15 years. Considered by many baseball players to be the most respected of his time, of his era. And I was listening to this commercial years ago, and I've tried to look for it, and I can't find it. It was on the radio. And it talked about Derek Jeter talking about his father and all the things about baseball that he taught him. He taught him about teamwork. He taught him about making sacrifice. He taught him about you know, running the play out to the end. Taught, taught him about patience and practice. And then he ends the commercial with saying, and at the time, the mistake that I made is I thought my dad was teaching me about baseball, but he was really teaching me about life. And so I think that's where we in, in Western culture get a little confused. We forget that the lessons are already there and that we don't have to get by them or, or, or avoid the challenges to get to recreation, right? Like Dr. Barr would tell us, now we don't have to make ice cream together where it took three or four people, you know, a couple of hours to do it, turning a hand crank, somebody adding the salt and the, and the ice and somebody adding the ingredients. Now we go out and we buy a half gallon of ice cream to save time. For what? Typically, it is to watch TV or to get on the computer. This is a great quote from one of the early inventors of wilderness therapy, uh, observed by Will White, who wrote a, a dissertation and a, a wonderful paper on wilderness therapy. And he was quoted as saying, whenever we adopted what we've come to con call contrived experiences, the overall impact diminished for the participants. So it was in, it's in the context of the natural things. That's why we tell you the stories of wilderness therapy. That's why your, your phone calls and your updates and the journals are about the stories. And then it becomes our job as therapists to unpack them, right? To, to make meaning out of them, 
and to help everybody, including the child, see the parallels between what was going on at home and the experience that they're having right now, building a fire and cooking dinner for the rest of the group. And this really does lead into, like I said in the beginning of this webinar, a broader and deeper idea about trauma and where it is stored. So I'm gonna have a couple of slides on, on brain science, very basic stuff. The brain stores memories in clusters, clusters called cell assemblies as interconnected or associated events. So we think of our memories as something up here, as something usually that we see in our mind's eye. That's the most typical recollection of memory, either oral, audio, or, or, or visual that we hold on to, and then we report it back through our words. Because of the way in which memories are triggered by association and experience, odor, texture, sound, or object reminiscent of any part of a memory stored in the cells, the brain can stimulate associated memories. So these memories that we have are, are spread out all over the brain. And oftentimes, the best way to access them is not through verbal dialogue recollection, right? Sometimes it's to get somebody up and moving, to get them engaged in an experience. And then from that, they can access memories, not only more, better, but memories that they don't even know that they have, that are invisible to the conscious brain. Because memories are with a, with a high emotional content, pleasant or unpleasant, are, off, are more easily recalled by the brain. Traumatic memories have a sort of hierarchical power over other less emotionally laden ones. So our trauma has a bigger effect than, than lots of times of, of peace and serenity, is what this suggests. We take in information through all the five senses. Many traumas are pre-verbal experiences that occur before we learn to express ourselves through speech. It is difficult to reach these wordless places and reflect upon them exclusively through the use of language. But when our bodies are engaged, we can move through the memory and show what happened rather than try to reconstruct it through words. And this is why when I hear, especially therapists, psychiatrists, who don't know about wellness therapy, say something about it ignorantly, I, I, I don't understand it. It's the most obvious, effective form of therapy that there is. It's experiential therapy, which is more effective with resistant clients Resistant meaning they don't want to look at it, they're incapable of looking at it, they're pushing up against it, or they're just unaware of it. So it, it's more effective at accessing the issues, at treating and repairing those issues, than talk therapy. It's like, and those of you who, who've been through it or are going through it, you know it's like an accelerator. It's like a therapy accelerator. And this is part, part of the brain science behind it. I just read a book. It's not quite out yet. She gave me a preview, preview, excuse me, a preview of it, Tion Dayton, wonderful book. Trauma shuts feelings down, recovery wakes them up. The recognition that healing trauma is, mind -body process, is a mind-body process has increasingly influenced many current forms of therapy. We need to reconnect and feel the stories of our lives in order to heal them. And she goes on to say, in Western culture, our over-reliance on words has led us to undervalue experience and overvalue talk. That over-reliance has also led us to create forms of therapy that are not especially useful in resolving trauma. And I don't mean big T trauma necessarily. I mean small T trauma, middle-sized T trauma, any kind of pain, difficulty, hurt, sadness, fear, anxiety. And like Dr. Dayton says, in our Western culture, we put far too much emphasis on talk therapy. And I love talk therapy for the highly motivated client. But even myself, who, who goes to talk therapy and has for years, still involve myself, not only as a practitioner, but as a participant in experiential therapies at times. So let's talk about the features that the research shows that, 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 that show that wilderness is, is effective. What, what are the features that, that demonstrate its effectiveness, that lead it to being effective? One of the things that research shows is the relationships with the instructors, that mentoring relationship. And I think that the fact that the field instructors in wilderness therapy are oftentimes counterculture is an effective contribution to that. Because again, as I always say, they don't look like, sound like, or smell like their parents. And that is an advantage. Because part of identity development is to reject parental influences and intrusions and, and, and even connection to define oneself. And so when you bring in a teacher, a mentor, that you live with for eight days, that, that you depend upon to live and at least survive comfortably, you're much more likely to take leadership and guidance from them, especially because it comes and sounds different than the way, the way their parents would talk about it. Small group living is one feature that was identified by participants 
as being a, an effective component, that microcosm of the group. That's why so many parents will say to us, after a few days, you get my child in a way that, that his or her outpatient therapist hadn't gotten or hadn't seen because they hadn't lived with them. And, and it's, it's better than, than residential treatment center living in many ways. Residential treatment center is, is wonderful and fine and necessary. And many of our students go to residential treatment or therapeutic boarding schools after our program. But having to live with staff for eight days and, and function together effectively to be able to live comfortably is a, is a huge piece of it. And those small group environments replicate the same kind of relationship dynamics at home. So we don't have to rely on reports from you. We can see it. And if we see something dramatically different, then that's an important question too. Why does it look different here? What are the elements here that weren't present in the home environment? And how can we replicate those? Work is an important part of it. In the book, Nurture Shock, the authors discuss this idea that in Western culture, we've replaced work with recreation in the family. You know, we look for work towards recreation. Maybe that's because we as parents working so hard and so many hours in the work week and that continues to increase in America that we're looking forward to that. We want to, we want to share that with our children. Survival skills are an important component. The having the, the natural and logical consequences that wilderness living offers, like a shelter, like a fire that you make to cook your dinner and stay warm at night, like packing up your gear, like making sure that you're all working together for, for, to cook the meals and to carry the food and to clean up. Leverage and containment. You know, there is a leverage piece. You, you don't want to overuse that, right? You don't want to hover over and above the student and the client. That's not what it's about. But there's something about it that naturally says, I want to get back to my life. I want to get back to real living, which I always find strange that real living is living in this, this world that is full of virtual realities. And the unreal world, as we imply from that statement, is living out in nature, being present with yourself without computers and, and television and media and social media and green screens, right? which is real and which is not real. But anyway, there's this want to get back into the flow of things. And so that automatically creates leverage. There's a vulnerability that I think creates leverage. And I think that's why we can get more parent work done than some programs, some other methods of, of, of therapy, because you feel vulnerable. And so there is a, a level of attention that you give to your work that you might not give if things were more known, more inside of your comfort zone. So I think leverage includes the parents too. Like I said, wilderness itself, nature, the, the beauty of nature, it has no bias, right? It just treats everybody the same and you can't fight with it. Uh, you know, when we have days and days of rain or cold weather or the bugs and the muggy weather or whatever it is, you all are coping with it and you're learning to deal with it and you're learning frustration and tolerance and you're learning delay of gratification and you're learning to plan and you're learning to be patient and you're learning to, to be present. And that presentness, that, that mindfulness about what you have and that you're okay and that you're safe increases gratitude, increases awareness in other areas, gives you uh, more effective access to resources, emotional and psychological resources so that you can help yourself. The physical and emotional challenges, I've, I've said something about those. Uh, you know, when, when coming off of a tough hike, um, accomplishing a, a group objective or goal for the week, um, dealing with the weather, that's why I always say that, that sometimes the best wilderness therapy is just in the winter. Wilderness and the winter becomes our teacher. Learning how to solve problems, the, the, the use of metaphor, that's one of my favorites as we borrow from Native American uh, rituals and metaphor a, a lot. And by doing so, again, we're able to tra transmit, communicate the same values, but they're coming through a different lens. And that bypasses resistance. Relationship skills in real time, right? Eight days staff, eight day shifts for the staff groups that, that have senior members of the group and new members of the group and they're mixing up and that opportunity to mentor and to be mentor is powerful. The experiential education, active learning, rituals I've discussed, we introduce a lot of our, our processes into rituals and that's a lot, a lot of that is lost in our, in our culture and our society today is those, right, those rites of passage and rituals. And then the solo experiences was, was identified. That time 
three days, four days, maybe once or twice during your child's stay where they don't have any conversation with anybody. The staff observe them and they watch them, but they don't talk to anybody. And they sit with themselves for two or three days, get, a, get acquainted with themselves and the company that they are for themselves. Most simply put, somebody told me one time that the way they think about it is a delivery method. It's a delivery method that we can deliver all of the traditional research pro proven therapies that there are out there. In addition, on top of, with the backdrop of wellness therapy, we can do that. There, there, there are no physical walls, but there definitely is containment, right? You, you, more, maybe more than, than in their entire life, in the sense that they're not going to see anybody else but that one staff shift that they're with, and then the seven, eight, or nine peers that they're with. And that's really powerful. You can really turn up the, the, the magnification on an issue, turn up the volume, amplify it to make it clear. And the repetition of it all provides amplification so you can all see it more clearly. So there's that kind of containment. Um, like there's the natural observation. Natural observation is a scientific term that, that is not about um, studying something by running it through a bunch of tests. It's watching somebody do something naturally, maybe work on a, a problem in a, in a classroom, or in this case, watch children, young adult and adolescent children living, and then providing natural observation. Here's what I saw today during dinner. Here's what I saw when you got your letters and how you responded to the group after that. And it, it, it's inclusive, right? There, there's, there's not all these distractions. You're taking away all the escape routes psychologically for, for the individual. And so that they're brought face to face with their issues. They can't run away from them as easily. And then you can practice all these evidence-based practice like cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, communication skills training, positive peer culture, social learning, on and on and on. Right? We, we use all of those. And we use them as they fit the client, as they fit the population of the group, as the therapist is inclined. In addition to this beautiful backdrop. And then you can hold a lot of the variables constant. Right? You're managing the diet. We have a focus on, on a healthy diet and exercise as a part of alleviating anxiety and depression, which are a part of a lot of the presenting issues of our clients and students. We're taking away the caffeine, making sure that they're drinking water, and, and the diet that they have out there is very low in sugar. And there's a lot more sleep that most of them get. Some struggle with sleep, and then we try to teach and practice relaxation, meditation, mindfulness techniques, but for the most part, they get more sleep, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hours than they were getting at home. And it's wonderful. And they're really tired at the end of the day. Less time exposure to green screens, that is computers and other electronics. And the first time I wrote this, this slide, or a version of this slide, was probably 2000. And that idea is so much more relevant now than it was 15 years ago. Like I said, there's a, there's a real strong emphasis at Evoke on mindfulness techniques, the mindfulness in terms of formal meditation, but also being present with yourself. That's why we don't talk about future information except for at designated points in the, in the program. That's why we don't spend a lot of time re on regrets. We, we try to move through it and say, what's going on here and now? What's the here and now experience? What happened tonight in therapy? And what, how, how can that inform us about the future and the past? But let's pay attention to right now. Let's pay attention to how you're feeling and how you're dealing right now. Like I said, I've said in many ways, wilderness is no respecter of person. So why wilderness? It provides a metaphorical experience, which is a way to bypass resistance. And this includes ceremonies and rites of passage, right? One of the best ways to go to, to bypass resistance is to go in through the back door, to access the unconscious conflicts, fears, anxieties, injuries in, in any client by using metaphors. The positive peer milieu, is, peer, peer, peer milieu cannot be overstated, right? It is, it's a very powerful thing to watch a, a, a student or a client move through the process and get to the point where they're mentoring. And we know that we're much more invested and aware of the things that we teach than just the things that are taught to us. And so putting them, giving them that opportunity and putting them in that role, even at times as a, as a it's kind of a step ladder, like, like, a, like a boost up to the next stage can be incredibly powerful. Finding out who they are. 
you know, this idea that Maslow had said that you had to take care, you know, that when you're taking care of your basic needs here at the bottom of the pyramid, you're not finding out who you are. Then what better way to find you out who you are than make it through a challenge? And that's maybe one of the most universal expressions that students and clients give to me at the end is that sense of accomplishment, that sense of doing something that in the beginning they said, I can't. And that they learned that they can. And how powerful is that? Like I said, resistant adolescents and young adults, that experience of being able to say, I, I don't want to, I feel threatened by what my parents are teaching me, but being able to talk to them without talking about it. And then later on, as resistance decreases and as they feel safe, being able to see how the lessons apply to them. And the wonderful thing about metaphor um, and, and, and wilderness therapy is that if you use metaphor, it has application at many levels and it can meet the client with where they're at. If you talk directly about an issue, let's say school grades, then the resistance is easily triggered. Besides the fact that part of the resistance is removed because there's a sense of vulnerability, there's a sense of being out, it's a, it's a culture shock. It's a cultural shift, a cultural change. There's a, there's a sense of self-efficacy or self-esteem through accomplishment, which, like I said, in Western cultures is challenged in these days. I've talked about the group microcosms, the removal, the, somebody called it a digital detox, the removal of distractions and defenses. And, and that even means positive things. Like That's why we start off with just letters with mom and dad, sometimes siblings, and then, and then we can move on to extended family and other contacts. But we're going to narrow things down to increase the focus. And we're going to remove things. You know, students will ask me about books, good books. And I'll say, you know what? Now is not a time, you know, this eight or 10 weeks is not a time for you to be reading some of the classics. That will come. But this is not that time. And that's not a bad thing or a negative thing. It's just we're, we're, we have a specific focus right now. Uh, inability to manipulate wilderness. I think that speaks for itself. The fight isn't with the... the uh, antagonist isn't mom and dad anymore or the police or teachers. The antagonist, antagonist now is the earth, right? The, the sun and the rain. And so the, the, the developing hero, as I like to call them, is the one who understands that the only real battles are the ones that are fought inside. And then wilderness does a great job of facilitating that, that shift forward between fighting with the system, fighting with parents, fighting with authority, and realizing that the fight is really inside of yourself. It's a sterile assessment environment. It's not sterile, physically of course, but it's sterile in the sense that you're removing a lot of variables, like I said, and you're holding a lot of variables constant. You're removing negative influences, or this is important because there are negative influences out in the group. They're observed, that's the difference. The difference between the negative influences that occur in our program versus the ones that occur, occur in a public school or at home in the city is that we're observing them, right? We're putting them under a microscope and we're talking about them during the many groups that happen throughout the day. And this is an important point to say. The most important session is not necessarily the session that your student, that your child, that the client has with a the therapist each week. It's not that. It's the one on a Sunday afternoon when your son or daughter doesn't want to hike anymore. It's the one on a Friday morning when they're homesick. That's the session that matters. It's that hike on a Saturday evening when the group got out of camp late and they're bickering and fighting. And that standing group that we call, that's the most important. That's the here and now. That's the stuff that they can't hide or can't ignore because it's showing right up, right up to their face in their face. Outside of the comfort zone of vulnerability, there's this developing balance this is development of inter interdependence like what can i do for myself and how can i rely on others and adolescents and young adults don't know how to do that right very well they, 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 it's it's black or white it's all or nothing it's the baby and the bathwater. it's i don't need you to, to to feel like an independent person i don't need you versus the other side of it can be i need you for everything you, i need you to help me with everything I can't do this. I can't, I can't, I can't. And so we start to identify and help them develop this idea of here's what I can do for myself. Here's what I must do for myself. I can, I'm the only one who can do it. And here's where I need help. I need support. I need love. I need attention. I need connection. I need feedback. I need boundaries. 
I need assistance. And then they have to try the old stuff. Sometimes they try it for a week. Sometimes they try it for two months. They have to experience the futility of their old ways of coping. That, that, that old way of escaping, of running away, whatever it was. They have to experience the futility of it before they're going to be willing to change it. Because in their mind, you want them to change. They don't need to change. I think this is important. This is something else I've added to this presentation about play therapy. To say we're informed by play therapy, I, I think, is, is legitimate because they, they, they share a lot of the same base, basic tenets. Play therapy with young children. And in a sense, we're not doing play therapy all the time, although we have tried to have games every day and try to have fun. We really are talking to the small injured child and inside of all of us in therapy. That's what we're doing, right? And that, that's, a, that's a visceral kind of exploration. It's not, a, it's not a verbal or an oral exploration. The place therapist's aim is to provide developmentally relevant treatment in a child's own language. Play is the language of children and offers therapists access to their world. And that's why I think the work and, and, and the games and the activities of wilderness therapy, that's the language of your children. That's why outpatient therapy wasn't enough for them. A play therapist is not looking for children to be able to discuss cognitively the meaning or content of their play, but recognizes that the subconscious issues of children float to the surface through play. That's why sometimes we tell them all that we tell you, but sometimes it's just for you. I just had an experience this week where my daughter said, I don't think you know me. And I thought to myself, well, my first thought was, yeah, I do. <laughs> right, that's what I thought. I thought, I know you pretty well. I'm a therapist. I'm pretty good at this. But, but that would have missed the whole point. It would have proved her point. What she was saying is sometimes you're intrusive. Sometimes, you know, my therapist doesn't look at me when I walk in the door and start pointing out my insides, right? It wouldn't be, I would be defensive. I would feel threatened. I would feel unsafe. I'd feel naked. And for us as parents, it's not always our job to look into our children, even though we might see things and know things about them that they don't know about themselves, even if that is true. And sometimes we're wrong and inaccurate, but even when it's true, it's not our job or it's not appropriate to say it out loud. It's our job to know it and then to act as that, that information, that, that assessment, that realization that we have as it informs us to act. But that's for us and not to give back to them sometimes. So we, we, we try to see, our, we try to understand them. We try to understand what, what's going on for them, how they're functioning. We offer some of that back to them in the form of feedback and some of that merely informs us adults, us parents. Through play, they experience a sense of control while learning to manage or regulate their feelings and impulses. As they become socialized, children learn to handle power and control in adaptable ways. And play offers them a safe climate in which to do this. And I think this, this microcosm that gets created in wilderness therapy is much like this third bullet point. Right? It's a safe, manageable world, manageable universe for them to, to practice in, to practice relationships, to practice dealing with power, to practice dealing with intimacy, with relationships, with problem solving, with frustration, all of that. And I, although this is, this is language directly taken from play therapy texts and educators, I think it has its relevance because it's a very shared view, shared lens with wilderness therapy and with experiential therapies. So what's the goal of wilderness therapy? I've, I've separated it out into these 10 goals. It is a getting their attention, a creating a new bottom, right? People say people don't change until they hit bottom. Well, we can help create or facilitate a bottom sometimes. Sometimes when a boss fires an alcoholic, that's a bottom. Sometimes when, when a wife says, I'm leaving you because you're an alcoholic, that's a bottom. And, and those are oversimplified examples. But sometimes wilderness therapy can be a new bottom. So that's part of our job as, as parents with, with limits, with consequences, is to create bottoms. Um, it can help you manage the crisis, right? You're in a crisis, you want to make long-term decisions, but it's, it's tense and it's, it's trauma triggering for you. And so wilderness slows everything down, gives everybody a chance to take a break, to reassess, to reevaluate, and to look forward. Of course, in wilderness therapy, because of its design, we can really individualize treatment plans. We can serve a very wide variety of, of clientele, of, of presentations, of diagnoses, because we can put them in specific niche groups with specific therapists in specific populations, and those groups are relatively small. The natural assessment that I described before, 
as well as formal testing in, in, a, in an environment where many of the variables are controlled, like their medication, like the substance abuse, like exposure to peers, those kinds of things, of course. You can do some family systems work, create a new focus on, on the system changing in ways that I think can't happen or don't happen in other versions of therapy because of the, some of the things I've talked about tonight. And you're preparing students for the next setting. It helps participants move from resignation to acceptance to investment in this process. And so it doesn't happen the first time they hear about or, or the idea that some form of aftercare is introduced to them, but they can move toward that. And here's the most important thing. They also realize, and this is hard even for the adults, this is hard because they can become happier here, most of them, many of them, in ways that they haven't been for years. And, and, and when they reflect back on it, the, the alumni, they'll say that was one of the happiest, most peaceful, most liberating times of my life. So you give them a taste of that, and oftentimes that can help them buy into a, a plan along with, with, in the case of young adults, along with their therapist, along with their parents, to buy into it, to help co-create a plan for themselves that's going to be effective and helping them maintain some of the gains that they've began here. It, it's a softening effect. It takes the sharp edges off demonstrative and dangerous behaviors, right? We have a pretty low floor as well as a, a high ceiling here. And so a lot of students and clients wouldn't qualify for various levels of care, schools, transition programs, if it weren't for the wilderness beginning, for this, this first intervention. So it has a softening effect. It can change the level of care, right? Some students, if they went straight to a therapeutic program, no matter what the age, would, most, would need to be in something much more clinical, much more rigid, a lot more boundaries. But wilderness therapy can actually change the, the, the behavior, change the presentation, the coping in such a way that they can qualify for a lower level of care. It's great for socialization skills, especially for those students who struggle with nonverbal learning, disability issues, autism spectrum issues, Asperger's and so forth. It really is effective because you have this microcosm, you have this, this kind of staff coverage, and you have this ability to, to focus and practice it with repetition. And then, of course, it's all assessment. It's all assessment. That's why it's never a failure. You know, there are times when we wish we could have had a bigger gain. But wellness therapy, because it's an assessment, is always effective. Because even when you have a client who struggles all the way to the end, you're learning something about what does and doesn't work. I have some pictures here. Some of you have seen some of these over the years. There's a young man making a bojo fire. There's a young woman sitting in her ceremony that the group created. Uh, after she moved to air phase. This is a backpack. Again, the backpack, I, I tell the story of one of my first students who, while we were hiking, he was my first student, while we were hiking, he was describing the pain and the difficulty at home, and then he would vacillate between that and describing the pain of his lopsided backpack that he packed in a hurry that morning. And I was fascinated, this is like my first or second week as wilderness therapist, I was fascinated with the, the experience of not knowing what he was talking about at a given point in time and how powerful one was evoking the other. The differentiation and distance. This is the idea that the pulling apart of the family so that everybody can get more clear, take their in own inventory, work on themselves to create the possibility for, for a connection. So you, you pull them apart, you do it through letter writing, you do it through less frequent contact, right? Mom and dad work on mom and dad, Son and daughter work on themselves. Phone calls help. Webinars help. Readings and assignments help. And then everybody gets more clear. And then the capacity. As I always say, it's not just me. But the first ingredient in intimacy is a, is a well-developed self. And so that distance that gets created by this intervention helps to create a, a classroom, if you will, for that development of self. And then intimacy is possible, more possible. I think letters from home, I think letter writing therapy can't be overestimated. So, so powerful. I have the, that same picture. Ritual symbols and rites of passage I talked about. A couple of quotes I like. Fritz Perl, he is a, a, a founder of Gestalt therapy. He talks about inside is the booby prize, right? We, we think about that, that being the goal of, of therapy. And I think we look for that even in this experience sometimes. But sometimes it's deeper than that. It's something unspoken. It's something some kind of healing, some kind of visceral experience that, that's hard to put into words because it's, it's an experience. And that's why going out to the field, even for parents, 
is something that when they come back and they say, it's different than I thought. Almost always is it, is it a positive, unexplainable experience. Experience which destroys innocence also leads one back to it. So it's that idea of experiential therapy. This is uh, something I wanted to add to this one too. I've been thinking about this idea lately and I wrote about it and I have a couple of quotes from something I wrote about the idea that all therapy is sort of an experience if we think about it correctly, well enough. And that means it's not the exchange of information. And I think that's what is missed by many clients and some practitioners, that it's the exchange of information, it's the teaching, it's the advice. That's a part of it. We, we call that sometimes anchoring therapy. But the experience of walking in metaphorically naked, right? And, and to take the risk to expose myself to the therapist and have the possibility of her judgment, whatever that might be. Could be clinical judgment, could be moral judgment, could be just emotional judgment. To take that risk and to have an entirely different experience, ideally, where she just looks at me with love, with acceptance, with compassion, with understanding. That experience is so profoundly healing, more than any exchange of information. Safety is a prerequisite to optimal reconstruction and the client is held by the therapist in the mind of the therapist. I talk about that a lot. Conflicts in this experience become manageable. I talked about that. And trying, what we're trying to do is create a, a corrective experience. Something different than happened. I, I say this all the time. When my children come to me, like this experience I had with my daughter where she came to me and she shared something that, that I didn't like, that, that triggered me, that I felt shame about, that I didn't understand her. Me, I didn't understand her. And I... I, I didn't do it perfectly, but if I can just sit there and think, say, thank you for telling me. Good job in telling me. I need to hear that. I need to know that's what you're feeling. I need to see it through your eyes. That, that, and I can do that for the client. We can do that for your children. And a, a much easier, and we can teach you how to do that when they come back. Experiential interventions and metaphor are not a threat. They don't threaten the client. Engages, engaging the sense of the entire body like I talked about. And then there's this benefit that comes both, both when somebody is engaged in an experience, in, an, in a role play, in an incident out in the field, one learns as much about it when they're the person that is the center of attention as they do when they're sitting on the outside watching. We learn so much by observation. And then of course, anchoring is what gets provided to you through the therapist's phone calls and through, through those conversations. So here's something I wrote recently as, as with regards to all therapy. Therapy is a place we go to receive a different response than one we, one we received in our earlier context, the home of our childhood. Therapy is a place we go to to be received. We go to be received completely, entirely. An adequate therapist responds to our warts, our wounds, and our symptoms with calmness, understanding, patience, and curiosity. This therapist is not anxious or eager to fix or heal us, but rather is passionate about finding us. And when we are found, seen, and heard without the anxiety, anger, frustration, or disappointment, we experienced in our earlier context, we come to believe that we are okay. We come to be able to look deeply into ourselves beyond the judgments of our symptoms or diagnosis. We look into our wounds and our traumas with compassion and understanding, and in this we heal. We come to experience the adequate therapy container as grace, and this grace is the transformative ingredient in the experience of therapy. Carl Rogers' idea of providing unconditional regard for his clients wasn't in the technique. It was in the magical experience of providing a place for the whole client without advice or solutions born from the therapist's notion that something was off course. This grace is what the alcoholic experiences when he shows up at an AA meeting and confesses himself to others. And they respond with, you are welcome here. You are in the right place. So that just kind of puts a cap on this idea that we do engage the senses. We do expose them to an experience that, that is beyond words that accesses the pre-verbal and the non-verbal trauma, wounds, fears, anxieties. We try to give them, in the end, a corrective experience where we regard them with patience, with curiosity, that it doesn't trigger our trauma, that it doesn't trigger our fear and anxiety, so that we send back a message that something is wrong, the world isn't safe, and you're not okay. And that kind of experience, all of that combination, along with the dialectical behavioral therapy, uh, techniques, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy, all the 12 stuff, all that stuff that we add into it is a wonderful, wonderful mixture uh, on top of this incredibly beautiful, transcendent, wilderness approach. So that's the, that's the webinar for, for tonight. I'm happy to take 
any topic related questions. I'll take them as we go to the end. Let me go through the slides. We want you to go to six of these. You are assigned to go to the six of these. This is one of the best things I think you can do to help your child. Go to this meeting six times while your child is with us and don't, don't put it off. Follow us on social media. You can find out about announcements, upcoming events and so forth. And you can also find about new blog posts. You can get my book on Amazon. You can get an audio version of it, CD or audible.com. You can go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page. 10% goes to families who can't afford treatment. Upcoming parent support groups, we have four on the count. Well, three on the calendar. San Francisco, we're trying to come up with a date. August 18th, uh, contact 49jennifer at live.com. Washington, D.C., I'll be doing that August 27th at 7 to 9. The invite will go out this week. I don't know the location yet. And then New York City will be, uh, we're trying it on a Sunday. So it'll be Sunday from 4 to 6, August 30th, 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, intensives, upcoming intensives. We have an uh, opportunity. We have the parent workshop, which is not an intensive. That's August 15th and 16th. That's a two-day psychoeducational and experiential large group activity run by Dr. Goddard. So take a look at that. And uh, if you, we want every parent to go to that that possibly can. And then the more intensive therapy that I will be running. These are the last three that I'll be running for sure. Um, before I, I have some of our therapists start to do it. So family intensive, August 21st through 24th. Even if your child is with us, you could pull them out of the group if they're out in Trotta, because that's where I do it, and put them back into the group. So that's a possibility. So a family intensive, if you need financial assistance with any of these, this, these first few, we're going to offer that. So Heroic Journeys is on August 21st through 24th. That's with families. Heroic Parenting is with just adults, just, excuse me, just parents. So any parent, you can be, uh, come by yourself, you can come as a couple if you're ready and willing to work together. And then finding you is for any adult, young adult, older adult, anybody. It's just about finding a deeper, richer, more authentic version of yourself. That'll be October 8th through 11th. And then we have the Pursuits, pursuits trip. If you have any questions, go to our, our webpage. These are high adventure activities that uh, individuals, young adults, and also families can attend. All right, I, I have time for questions. How is Evoke different from other wellness program? I'll tell you a few things that, that, that stand out. The level of family education and work and support is unrivaled, period. Traveling all over the country, doing parent groups all over the country, parent workshops, parent intensives, uh, webinars, the webinar library, the live webinars, uh, the parent workshop at Entrada, the parent portal, the parent resources, it's, it's unrivaled. So that's the biggest, and our, our focus and belief that treating the entire family is gonna be most effective sets us apart. We're not the only ones doing it, but it, but our commitment to it sets us apart. Our commitment to research. There literally is no Willers therapy program that has done as much research as we have. And we've contributed to, to the general body of research more than every wilderness therapy program. So our commitment to research, our practice on whole health, is important and mindfulness is an important distinction for us. And then I would say this, this clinical spiritual savvy that we have, right? The, 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 what you're hearing right now is the difference. Our ability of our therapists to articulate the theory, to understand what they're doing, to be clinically sophisticated and compassionate sets us apart. It's, it's an incredibly intelligent and smart program. And I think that's what sets us apart. And we've been doing it for 20 years. So that's something we can say that not a lot of them can say. How can I be confident that the 10 goals of wellness therapy were addressed for my child? I suppose you can ask. Probably the best way to do it is to, to ask. And, and some of them are going to be up to you, right? Like managing a crisis, part of it is it just happened. But, but making sure that you're taking a deep breath and, and reassessing and reevaluating. Re but ask about any of those. This is something I want to say, and this, this question leads to it. Make sure on the phone call that you put your agenda out there and say, I would like to talk. I think, I always say this, the wilderness therapist typically feels that parents want to hear, unless told otherwise, all about the child for an hour. Right? Stories, examples, assessment. But if you want part of that, and then you want to say, you know, I want, to, I want half of this phone call to be about some of my questions. Can we get to those questions? Can you do a short review of my child's week and then get to this, these other questions about our relationships, or about family therapy, about things that we need to be doing, about next step? So part of the way to ensure that it's done. That's why we included in the parent portal prompts for you to ask questions like ask your therapist questions about 
a, specifically about a, a, a field visit for you. Ask them about a phone call. Tell them about your attendance at AA, right? We, we put that in the parent portal because part of this has to occur in a dialogue with your wilderness therapist on those weekly phone calls. So great question. How does it determine how long the child will stay in the program? That actually is the next webinar where I talk about it at length. But the short answer is it's, it's, a, it's a decision that gets made by you in a dialogue with the therapist. So you can talk about, I think if you ask about it before week three, it's probably unreasonable. But about week four, you can start asking about it. If you're getting anxious about next steps, ask them about that. So just say, I, I want to talk, can we spend two minutes on it? And a lot of times the answer might be, well, we're not ready yet. But sometimes parents also have logistical needs that need to get addressed, and that's okay too. So I'll say to a parent, let's plan out the schedule for you, and let's back into it then how that's going to fit in the treatment plan. So if you need to do your, your end of program visit on August 15th, for example, let's, let's put that on the calendar. And then we'll figure out if that visit's going to be a transition visit, a uh, take them home visit, uh, come out to the field and do a visit, and then he or she will leave a week or two later. Right? So if you have logistical needs, then you can put that on the table too. And there are other financial needs that you have to take into consideration. So the answer to the question is, it occurs, you make the decision, and that occurs as you consult and dialogue with your wilderness therapist and whatever home professional is supporting you, whatever educational consultant or other therapist is supporting you at home. And, and the next webinar on Thursday, I'm going to talk about length of stay and the beginning, middle, and end of the child's stay and what that looks like. So that'll be for the full hour. What are the six meetings you want to attend? Any of the any combination of Al uh, Anon, Families Anonymous, uh, Codependence Anonymous. Any combination of those. So you can go to those. I'm gonna, Stephanie. I'm going to pull that up, and then you can put this back up if you need to. So you can go to. Uh, oh, that's not it. You can go to any of these websites, and they will show you meetings in your area. And if you live in a fairly reasonably sized metropolitan area, you'll have choices of meetings every day, all the time. Okay. Any other questions, Stephanie? Is the goal of my child's therapist to only speak of her and not to relate to me as an individual in the process? They're not your therapist. So you'll, you'll, they will coach you. They'll give you feedback. They'll give you some training, but they're not your therapist. They're, they're, they, they'll, they'll give you ideas about the system, systemic interventions, systemic assessments, and so forth. But yes, if you want deep therapy, then but deep therapy, I don't mean deep therapy, you want therapy for you. And, and, and you've heard me say this if you've been on any, any webinars besides this one. I go to therapy, have been for years, don't plan to stop. Don't, I don't see it as a burden. I don't think of myself as overanalyzing. It's a place that I can go that I can practice finding myself again. And because I have a good therapist, that's what she allows for. So that's for me. That's my place. That's how I practice self-care. That's the place where I have to go. I don't have to perform for anybody. I don't have to be anything for everybody. I don't have to get it right. I don't have to know the answer. I just get to go there and show up. And then I have a, a loving, wise container that contains me. And the blog I wrote on my own website, drbradreedy.com, about the myths of therapy, exposing the myths of therapy. And I'd welcome any of you to go there and read it. That really is that idea of what therapy is and what to look for in a therapist. So that's a great question because it's re they're really not your therapist, although they'll, they'll therapeutically inform you and educate you. They're not going to do the deeper work with you. It's not going to be about you, not, not to a large degree. How often do they get therapy out in the field? All day, every day. Ten groups a day? five minutes to an hour to two hours every day. It's all therapy, all the time. Therapy breaks out during breakfast, during a hike, during bow drill fires, during cleanup. They have group sessions all the time. The therapy session with the therapist happens once a week. And then that therapist also runs two groups a week, but they have at least two groups a day, as many as 10 or 15 a day. And then the, 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 the grist for the mill, everything becomes grist for the mill. And, and I often think that the most important work, the most important analysis probably happens on the therapist days, right? 
That's when the treatment plan is rewritten. That's when the therapist is developing assessment and analysis of the client, of the situation of going forward, the prognosis and so forth, the recommendations. But the most important therapy happens when that therapist drives away and, and in between that and the next visit. Because it's real time, it's real, it's hard. Right? Many, many times, clients and students will say, I want more therapy. But that's the easiest part of our program. And I've learned even in my life that therapy is the time in between my sessions. And I go to get recentered, regrounded, right? recalibrate, refocused, reaware, if you will. But then I have to go out and I have to do the hard stuff. I have to have honest conversations, difficult conversations, scary conversations, face my fears, deal with my anxiety, practice my tools, practice my mantras, whatever it is. That, that's the therapy. So it's really important that, that you hear, and I'm not saying that as a, a, as a gloss over, the therapy is every day, all day. It's what takes precedence over everything. All right. Thank you all for joining me. I hope these points of, points of contact are helpful. I think this is one webinar, Stephanie, that we'll unlock for a while. Because I think this is one webinar that might be helpful for you to pass on to your friends and family members to help them understand what your child is going through and what, what is wellness there. Because most people have so many misconceptions. They think it's boot camp. They think it's fear-based, right? They think it's behavioral. And it's, such, it's so much more than that. All right, the webinar I'll be doing this Thursday night, August 6th, will be 7 p.m. Mountain Time. I'll be talking about the beginning, middle, and end of your child's experience. Talk about what those stages look like, how length of stay is decided, and what you might be looking for in your child's, your individual child's progress throughout the program. So have a great week. I'll talk to you Thursday night and take care. Bye-bye.